If you're feeling concerned about giving a performance review to an employee, don't worry, because you aren't alone. I hope you're good this now. is for you. Yeah, we're good. Hi, my name is Scott Morris. I'm the Chief HR Officer here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And in the next five minutes, I'm going to help you to make sense of the stuff that really makes a difference. It's the people. And HR is here to help you make a difference with each one of them. You know, over the course of my career in HR, I've been an advisor to just about every level of management. And I've been asked the same question again and again. What magic words can I use to make my employees' performance evaluation go smoothly? I've been asked variants of that question by staff managers and by faculty supervisors. Now, while it's true that there are more effective and less effective ways of presenting a performance eval, the truth is that those who are most successful find that success long before the actual conversation with the employee takes place. Those who achieve the most success do so because they're really good at creating the performance plan. In fact, it's pretty clear that if a supervisor invests the time and energy required to have a great performance plan, and then spends the time throughout the year engaged in an ongoing conversation with her employee, the evaluation almost always goes smoothly, strengthens the working relationship, and requires very little effort. So here's three things to keep in mind. First, share the ownership. Baseball great Yogi Berra was fond of saying that baseball is 90% mental, the other half is physical. In the spirit of that idea, a great manager instinctively realizes that her mindset is almost everything in management. Are you the owner and the employee is just the worker? Or are you partners, co-owners who play different but equally important roles, both jointly invested in the outcome? The way that you think about your relationship with your employee will be either the root of your success or your future difficulty. As the boss, you'll always have the responsibility for making the tough calls about strategy and direction. But from the beginning, do everything within your ability to build the employee's sense of investment. Rather than setting employee goals that just focus on tasks, consider ways that you can set goals that will help your employee to become an owner of the outcomes. Second, build clarity from the start. Performance planning is a perfect opportunity to help employees see where you're going, whether or not you've done that in the past. Have a conversation with your employee about your boss's goals and direction, and what that means insofar as your goals and direction. Help connect what you're asking of your employee to the stuff that matters to you and those above you. If your employee needs to develop in a specific area, say for instance customer service, or problem solving, or critical thinking, Take the time to establish the success measures up front. You don't need to tell him how to do his job, but you do need to be specific about the differences that you perceive between kind of successful and really successful. You need to help him understand the difference so that he has a guide rail, so that he can monitor himself to guide and improve his own performance. You'll find even greater success if you take time to create that definition together. That shared definition becomes a yardstick by which both of you can measure and evaluate the employee's performance. At evaluation time, rather than debating and arguing about what they did or didn't do it, you can both evaluate how close this performance matched the objective standard that you created together. Third, keep an open dialogue. Imagine opening your email one morning and finding your performance evaluation. Imagine that while you thought you were doing well, your boss doesn't seem to think the same. Imagine that you just learned that in your evaluation. In her book, Fierce Conversations, best-selling author Susan Scott reminds us that our careers, our organizations, our personal relationships, and our very lives succeed and then fail gradually and then suddenly, one conversation at a time. None of us likes surprises, whether we're individual contributors or supervisors, whether we're entry level or experienced. And the higher the stakes, the more we're going to hate that surprise if it's negative or if it conflicts with our own perception. The antidote to this situation is not always easy to execute, but it's very straightforward. Engage in an ongoing conversation, a dialogue, not a monologue, about performance. 
have the first conversation, the first time your performance isn't what you expect. Find opportunities to praise what she's doing well, and not just to correct what she isn't doing well. Feedback can be easier to give if it's your sincere intent to grow and develop the individual and not just correct the behavior. One conversation at a time, you'll build trust. And over time, that trust will help you to raise the bar higher, improve his performance, and ask him for more and more. These can be challenging concepts for some, and HR can help you, but you need to ask for that help early, before you have a problem. If you want to know more, talk with your HR business partner. If you don't have an HR business partner in your unit yet, don't worry. Employee Relations is always available for help and advice. So in a nutshell, uh, I think this video uh, consolidates many aspects of what we've spoken about earlier, of amongst others, transparency, uh, openness, uh, sincerity, and regular engagement with your subordinate. Because no one really likes surprises, uh, especially if they will come rep in a very a strong and punitive language of indicating that you did not perform as well as you thought you did. It does it not matter which level you might be at, no one will take that one kindly. So in this case, we are then saying some of the best practices need to be observed and obviously adhered to so that at least they will create a very good engagement platform. That is why on, sec on this section, we talk about day-to-day -day coaching and feedback. Uh, where we discuss performance often. Wise University indicate two cycles of review. It does not mean you only wait until that cycle. And one of our colleagues earlier on, um, reflecting her experience in the government environment where they did it four times, which is every quarter. So it all depends on the environment, but for university so far, it's only two formal cycles, but you line manager and your subordinate, you can do as how regular as you see and uh, see fit. Recognition of success or done things well does not mean always has to have to come with a prize or with a, an award, but just that verbal recognition, acknowledging that someone has been seen doing certain things. Concerns, it might be there. Don't wait until the review, formal session of assessment, or performance assessment or performance review. Engage and understand exactly what is happening on a regular basis. Check progress as a manager. In some cases, there are those who are from the school of thought of where you need to manage your manager, meaning you need to take some initiative to go to your manager and say, how am I doing? Am I doing well? Are you satisfied about my work performance? Are there any areas uh, that you probably feel I can improve? Or maybe if you do feel you probably need a little bit more volume of work, you can do so by indicating to your manager, don't wait for the uh, performance review session or performance uh, ass uh, assessment session. So these are some of the things that videos uh, we have shown, including the last one, uh, are articulating. The, it there should be a dialogue, it should be more, not a monologue. It shouldn't be you as a line manager just telling, telling, telling. You should seek to understand, engage, and, and rather listen at some stage. The regularity, I'm not gonna, the balance, uh, address trends as well as concerns. Jack Walsh did speak about before any significant uh, feedback provision or be it in terms of share option, be it in terms of bonuses or anything, this is what I like about you. In terms of work related, this is what I think you can improve. And he clearly said, this is what I think you can improve. It's not about what I don't like, it's about what I think you can improve. So again, the selection of language is very key. Uh, for those who are very observant. Um, we are adult in, 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 in our own accord. I think on the basis that this is a vocational environment, most likely we, everyone who's here in the workplace is more than 18 years old. So we're dealing with adults. So regardless of your position, you always have to deal with issues, deal with issues, deal with issues showing some respect. Uh, as a land manager, pay attention, attention to detail. Um, so that at least those who probably, for some reasons, are not rising to the occasion with your motivation, coaching, as well as the impetus, they can be able to find themselves a great strike, perhaps, and then they're able to improve their performance. And the, 
thousands of examples where employees might have been found in a situation where they are not doing as well, only to find that the influence of a manager will, will enable the employee to improve uh, the performance amongst uh, other things. And obviously the level of satisfaction, happiness, and many other things come out of a very fruitful, uh, conducive, as well as a joyful work environment. It matters to our lives. Remember, remember, we spend about nine hours a day at work and a couple of hours left at, on, on the day we spend at home whilst we are tired. So it, it's important that our work environment needs to be as joyful as it could be or as you could imagine. Thank people in person, going to a person and say thank you. It's a very important gesture. Um, obviously some other people value it more than others, but I think the norm is that if you go to a person and say to that person looking in the face, thank you for what you've done. Some people who might found a little bit of spark to say, I didn't know that I was even known in this place, let alone being uh, celebrated or acknowledged for what I've done. So some of these things are very minor in articulation, but are very impactful in, in doing or in practice. So, and the, some of the elements I'm not gonna dwell much here is when we look at, in terms of performance management, the old and the new paradigm, where the old paradigm looks at the backward looking um, in terms of what has been done in the past, forward looking in terms of what we can focus on. And the significance differentiator here is on the planning. Meaning if we spend a considerable amount of time planning for performance, you find it is easy therefore to manage performance and keep track of what has been done because everyone is looking forward as opposed to allow people just to perform and say, I'm gonna catch them during the performance review session. So the modern paradigm is saying, let us look forward and make sure that we all know where we are heading. As we go along the journey, we can just check how well we are going as we penetrate, sorry, as we maneuver, as we obviously travel our journey going forward. Point number two, one or two conversations a year on performance. These might be too a few or too limited. How about having regular sessions or regular chat? Uh, Uh, so how about the regular video chat? I mean, the, the regular uh, discussions much more often during the course of the year as opposed to once in a while or only once every six months. So the emphasis is on how regular it could be. Using process docu to document and address performance issues, using process to focus on the employee success. So again, these are just some of the dimensions of highlighting what is the new thinking in a space of PM, because we do know, I mean, I asked the question in your spheres, would you see PM performance management as a stick or would you see it as a carrot? And rightfully so, one of our colleagues says, it all depends. In some cases, when our employees have performed well, they would like to be assessed so that they can be able to show off, not necessarily the language that was used, but in my own interpretation, that they've actually succeeded. But in a case where but they have not, they will obviously be shy from, from the exercising or from the exercise of undertaking performance because they know themselves that they're not feeling good about the outcome of performance. So the new dimension therefore says, one, let us look forward. Two, let us have regular sessions. Three, let us have positive mind of saying, let us work together to ensure that we improve the performance of both our organization and our individual. And in the process where there are gaps, we can be able to proactively plan for interventions to improve that. So with a very uh, clear and uh, entrenched philosophy in terms of implementing performance management system. What emerges at the end of the day, in my view, and I strongly believe in that, is happy employees. So if employee is happy and is looking forward to go to work in the following day, the following month, and you can see his career blooming in the institution, you can imagine the kind of contribution that he actually gives in terms of performance within that organization. Even though it might not be smooth sailing, but he's more li than likely to face those waves uh, within the institution and still for uh, and, and steer forward to ensure that the organization succeeds. Now, in the book, Winning, that uh, Jack Welch published some years back, they actually speak quite a, a lot about employees just by virtue of understanding a purpose of why they were there and knowing that they are being looked at, looked after, and being recognized. They will go all the way, including working overtime without expecting to be paid for it. They will make sure that they die for the company because they know their contribution is looked at and looked after and their performance is looked at and their 
interest is being catered for. So in that particular con context, again, I would say, right, like I said from the beginning, there is no reason why performance management should not be undertaken by any institution if it means it is done for the right reasons. For those institutions that have undertaken those departments or units within even the university where they've undertaken, but they seem not yet to hit the necessary or the right chord, it's, there's an opportunity for them to improve as well as part of the maturity as we uh, alluded earlier on of the university. So we know that not all employees will perform at the top of their ability. You looking at uh, uh, Jack Welch's model, 10% at the bottom, 70% and 20. So what might be the contributing factor of the below performances or below performance or performing employees rather? What would be some of the reasons? One of them would be the complexity of the job. You might find that the job requirements is too much higher a level than a skill of an employee who is expected to perform that particular job. Number two, uh, maybe the employee in terms of qualification, which obviously give them certain elements of technical know-how to do the job, is found one thing. So that might be uh, another reason. The third reason might be the environment itself. Not that all these reasons are uh, equal or always applicable. We're just trying to find ways that are meaningful to contribute to a, a underperforming employee. Maybe the environment is not conducive. It might be the manager that he or she works with. It might be the colleagues. It might be the environment in terms of the legislative framework. It might be environment in terms of the physical environment where the employee is engaged with, which might hinder the ability to perform. It might be the employee herself not committed to actually performing. For many reasons uh, known to the employee, until you sit with him down, you probably won't know why he's not pulling through. It might be a misinterpretation of performance scores, and I hope this is probably not the major part of the contributing factor of why employees not perform or not being found to be performing well. It might be unclear expectations. It was a, maybe an employee was expecting a particular output, but because it was not interpreted correctly, he or she actually thought it was what was meant was the other. Uh, undesired outcome. So these are some and not all. I mean, there could be many. We didn't want to go into personal reasons, even though they do matter. We didn't want to go into personal reasons at this particular juncture because obviously they will know any end. Now, what we are saying is that during the assessment of performance, there will be an engagement with an employee. And if an employee is asked and given an opportunity to articulate uh, using the engagement model as I highlighted, at least we'll be able to understand why a particular employee is not performing. We will be able to understand why an employee is not performing. And once we do understand, which is point B, the reasons why an employee is not performing, then we can adopt a, a appropriate corrective action. Corrective action or rehabilitative action or approach or initiative that can assist both an employer and employee. So the lack of performance or non-performance by an employee is not a, a, a negative point to an employee only, but it's also a negative point to an employer and the organization. Because if you don't rise to your occasion, we miss a particular output that will be provided. You become a missing link in the spectrum of uh, employee performance within an organization as a whole. So because we have a responsibility as an organization to assist where things are probably falling short, let us look at some of the attributes slash activities or interventions that could be utilized to deal with the situation of underperformance. Number one, train the employee formally or informally. In other words, make sure that the employee is put through the paces. Obviously, once we've understood exactly what is an issue, uh, the employee's shortfall or employee's uh, element of causing a non-performance, underperformance. In, the, in other cases, we can adopt on-the-job coaching or mentorship. It does shade on employee to allow him to observe and probably be guided by senior uh, personnel within the employment realm so that that person can be assisted. Obviously, once we've gone through all the necessary legislative guidance, including the formal hearings, amongst other things, it would then be appropriate to assign a ascension, which is a demotion, because a demotion is a sanction as a result of a particular process of correctiveness. This is in a manner of rehabilitation, 
rehabilitating the situation as opposed just to destroy a person going forward. And this cannot be done unilaterally. Hence, on the employee the demotion, I'm circling with the legislative framework. We can also do an on-the-job training uh, through apprenticeship. We could also decide to change job positions and say, maybe instead of you becoming a receptionist, let you become uh, something else uh, as well. I mean, again, I'm just making very lame examples of this. I know your job positions might be much more complex than the way I'm actually articulating, but certainly changing a job position might be necessary. It might not be done unilaterally. It might be done using and following the processes within the company, including the internal transfer, including the uh, 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 probably the application for a new job position, and therefore a person will go through that and be able to put his uh, application like anyone would within an organization. So these are some of the options of dealing with a question of uh, correcting the underperformance. Obviously, if everything else has been done, Schedule 8 has alluded to it, it does permit it does permit an employer to depart, sorry, an employee to uh, depart or to be discharged of his duties or to be terminated from employment as a result of non or underperformance. It's well within the realm of the legislation, but as long as it's not being abused, there will be obviously a requirement to demonstrate that everything has been done within reason to assist this particular fellow employee for him to at least improve. Nonetheless, he would never, that's why. The organization would have taken such harsh or probably final uh, cutthroat decision of terminating employment. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, this is the end of session three on the uh, theory framework as well as context, as we have indicated. The time now is one o'clock, and the time for now to go to the practical sessions. As I've indicated earlier on, Practical sessions is where we as colleagues uh, take charge of this particular side of our presentation. How? By virtually engaging on specifics. And I'm just obviously using some of these just as a guide, not in a manner of presenting formally as I have. Strategic plan, we've spoken about it. Departmental operational plan, we've alluded to it. Job descriptions, we've already spoken about it. Performance agreement, we've spoken about it. All these a part and parcel of what assists the organization to be able to craft the proper way forward in terms of what we are dealing with. Now, <clears throat> uh, there is a practical exercise which I am not too sure whether we'll be able to do as well as we could uh, if we were in a class environment, uh, but this is a practical exercise. I'm going to touch on it, not that I'm saying we need to do it now, but uh, let me just nonetheless touch on it so that at least we will see uh, if it means your time permit, you can then uh, adopt or gather and, and do that. Where we require uh, attendees to obtain job profiles, uh, through the job profiles, uh, you obviously require to familiarize yourself with the template, and then the, the, the attendees, which is us sitting in the workshop or attending the workshop, we also require to att uh, understand the, the particular performance uh, management policy that the university does provide. So, uh, and the office exercise continue up until we are able to compile the job profile as so a performance agreement rather as it would be required until the end of it. What I have here with me is a performance agreement template. For all intents and purposes, I do hope it is still a relevant template. And if it's not, let me see. Um, uh, if any of my colleagues, let me see, Etienne is not back yet. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, if any of my colleagues from the business partners would be here, I would have asked him just to confirm whether this is still the correct one. Uh, but I do believe uh, this is the correct one. Let me just first check. Can you see my template, uh, individual performance agreement? I'm opening a Word document. A template individual performance agreement. Let me confirm whether can you see it on the screen. Can you just indicate whether you can see my performance agreement which I'm flashing on the screen? I think yes, we can. Quite right. awesome. 
Okay, so I'm just going to run through it. And, yes, uh, okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to, I'll run through it and just uh, cover some of the stuff. Is It's just an ordinary demographic. We call it demographic, employee name, designation, staff number, um, division, line manager. What becomes important is obviously the date of mid cycle a review and date of final review. When we say a date, we don't mean the date in the month, perhaps we mean the time. So in this case, mid month will be June or July uh, 2020. Uh, obviously the date one, the final one will be December 2020, as an example. The other information is obviously known to an employee or the incumbent as it were. Uh, these might change. For an example, for COVID reasons, I do know that some of staff members' final uh, review will be in February 2021, as an example. So that is why it becomes important to show where are we heading with this kind of date, because it will not always be uh, the ex December, for reasons now known that things they can change uh, because of unexpected uh, circumstances, phenomena. Hopefully, we don't have many of them in the near future. Now, there are various sections uh, to this um, job uh, in the individual performance agreement. The one part is, the second part is the work output part. And I've, as I've indicated, uh, maybe let me start one step back, gentlemen and ladies. Sorry, apologies for this jumping. Let me do this. I'm quickly going to go, which, which I still hope you can still see. I'm just quickly going to performance management policy. Hey, no, not this one. No, 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 it's not this one. Yeah, where is my, did I close it? Okay, I think I closed it. Let me not go back there because I closed it. It would take me some time to open it. I thought I'd open it because I wanted just to show that whilst we are focusing on work output, there were other elements like competencies like, and values, which we are not focusing much on in this particular phase of our performance management implementation. So, but they are there on the policy, they are mentioned on the policy. It's just that for performance management purposes, they are not necessarily being activated. It does not mean they are not there, but it, it is, they are there. However, they are not necessarily uh, engaged as part of performance management. So work output, in this particular case, an employee, because this is a document for an employee compiled in partnership with an employer, a line manager employee says, I, the undersigned, hereby agree that the key performance areas and KPIs reflected herein have been outlined for the purposes of performance agreement for the current performance cycle and do not reflect my complete roles and responsibility as set out in my job description. Simply put, we don't take a job description copy and paste. However, we look at what are the key KPAs that are necessary for the period in question. That is why the statement says this. That means performance contract or agreement can change year on year without having to change the performance, sorry, the job description. Because your position is still the same, but the priorities that we are focusing on for a particular period, the performance cycle might obviously change. So that statement seeks just to guide us in terms of that. In addition to these KPAs, I'm obliged to fulfill my responsibility as mentioned in my job description and any additional tasks within the scope of my position as reasonably specified by my line manager from time to time. One of the biggest things I found in practice is that people tend to indicate that, yes, we did sign a performance agreement, but during the course of the year, my manager added additional tasks. Now, I didn't know how to engage with that. It may be the manager did not take the version that was originally signed and amend it accordingly. He or she would have just added those tasks. Then it probably will find a, a bit of a disjuncture with you as you then uh, tend to understand or internalize how you should accommodate these additional tasks. So, but this section does indicate that it is expected that of course your manager can add additional tasks. But I think what becomes important is that the way those tasks and or KPAs are added, and I'm saying tasks or KPAs, because we can add a task within a KPA, or you can add a KPA, which obviously has got multiple tasks on its own. So, but the way that that should be done, should be done in the same way that you, you would have 
articulated the agreement. That means you can amend the performance agreement. It does not stick and stay and remain static for the duration of the period. Probably best practice does dictate that if that happens, there need to be amendment. Because for ease of analogy, we use a 100% time availability of employee. Therefore, when we derive scores, we derive scores in lieu of, are we then covering 100%? Meaning, if it means there's additional tasks, the question need to be, then can we then rework on the waiting? Because that waiting, that waiting we see there, uh, which I'm highlighting in red, means out of 100%, what does this KPA weighted as? And it is expected that with all the KPAs included in your agreement, all of them combined, they should give you 100%. Because that's 100% of the time, at least as we know, you're going to be available. That means if that is given to you, it will then translate to 100% commitment from each and every one of us. Now, in a case where by then we make amendment by adding another KPA, you can't keep the rest of the original KPAs at the same weighting because that means the additional KPA need to absorb some uh, allocations from other KPAs, hence the amendment of this performance agreement. But if you add a task, you might not need to make any revision on the KPA weighting because the weighting is on the KPA, not on the task. Only if you feel that the additional tasks is actually adding towards waiting on the KPAs, then you can revise. But at any given point in time, we should all always working towards 100% in terms of weightings of those KPAs. So here are the KPAs and here are the weightings. Let me explain something else as well. Part of the maturity we have been referring to or talking about is that as the time goes on within the university, we are going to have a library or a repository of KPAs. That means it is not just going to be a line manager thinking one night, and coming up with a KPA and just bang, giving it to an employee, really need. There is a systematic way of doing it. We have gone through with the a, 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 a HR practitioners through a talent management framework where we already have 53, um, sorry, uh, about 27 KPAs on the library. Each KPA has got a definition. And that means when we pull a KPA, we already know what it means as opposed to just using English loosely. So. In this case, we are saying this is KPA1. We're then going to pull it in here. In our next model of uh, entrenchment or adoption of performance management system, we will then pull in the definition for it to be visible. But as of now, as we speak, we had gone through a repository using a method influenced by talent management analysis, TMA method, where all uh, HR practitioners are familiar with uh, KPAs in the library. That means the naming conventions is similar and standardized and so forth. So with that in mind, it means anytime when a line manager wants to add a KPA, the first port of call will be, is this KPA available in our library, in our repository? Is this KPA already qualified and defined? If the answer is yes, then you can pull it in. As we move to the automated talent management and slash performance management system, our life would be much more easier. I acknowledge the fact that manual process can obviously take a bit of time because of coordination amongst other things. So here's a KPA, here's a waiting as a first part, then you're gonna have activities or tasks that would be in relation to unpack that particular KPA. For the purpose of the agreement in terms of benchmark, you will also indicate how you will measure the achievement of this particular KPA. And then we have a time frame that indicate by when this particular task would have, should have been delivered or achieved, also indicating some of the typical resources that might be required. And not all the time, you will always need resources at this level of individual employees. But at a, a level of departmental and at a level of uh, institutional, definitely uh, resources are mandatory for them to be completed. But at an individual level, it might not always be the case that you need resources to be reflected as part of your performance, uh, individual performance agreement. So this is just a simple and straightforward template 
complete a KPA of obviously knowing exactly what that KPA means, the tasks underneath indicate the weighting out of 100%, taking into consideration other KPAs. You also put in the indicators, the KPIs, you also indicate the time frame. When is are these tasks expected to be delivered and the resources applicable? One might ask and ask a question and say, but simply, so what if the tasks I'm performing are recurring? So which kind of date or time frame should I put in there? Then you are able to put the time frame in relation to the reoccurrence of these. Now it might be one, as I made an example about a, a receptionist slash a office administrator or secretary. If it means we're talking about scheduling meetings, you probably might be indicating that on monthly basis, we can do a review whether our meetings that we've been scheduling, we've been doing them as expected. I'm just making examples because you cannot put every Friday because you don't know how the frequency, but it is safe to say on monthly basis, we can expect to do a review because that time frame is a time frame that will be able to assist us. Remember, we spoke about the effort and output. Effort is an attempt for you to achieve an outcome. So whilst we can observe the effort, but what becomes meaningful is an output. However, the effort does assist us to see that if someone is experienced, he obviously is expected to do some of the things quicker than a novice. In this particular case, time frame is key so that at least we can then say, end of the month, let us review. And that is why in our performance agreement, you don't see the actual effort interpretation. You see what is the task, you see what is, our, uh, is expected in terms of measurement criteria by a batch of KPI. You can see when can we observe or can we assess or can we expect the task, the task to be accomplished. At the bottom there, we've got an agreement comments because, again, this is not science. Feel free to make comments. One of the questions asked by colleagues, this is when we are able to make a comment and say, bearing in mind that my activity X and or output X is dependent or is going to depend on the output from other department and other dimensions. I will make sure that I keep track and should there be any diversions, I will then notify my manager accordingly. That free text space allows comment to be made and obviously the manager will take note of your comment there. Not just to protect yourself, but to mention things that are relevant and that are, might affect your ability to deliver and some of the requirements, including an indication that now that you are assigned these tasks, you might need to undertake a special training, which will obviously be covered at the bottom when we look at the personal development planning. This is a second KPA. Uh, this was KPA one, this is KPA two, and then there will be KPA three, and then there will be KPA four. Now, one would obviously ask, how many KPAs should they be there? There is a rule of thumb, there's best practice. If it is done well, appropriately, you should not have in excess of six KPAs. And I'm saying if it is done well, because the library and the repository we're talking about is the very place that assists us to know, okay, so this is a, a right level of allocating a KPA. We have looked at many job profiles in many organizations. And it's unfortunate to probably say in some of these organizations, they take a task and they make it a KPA. Now you can imagine if you take a task, the task is almost elementary as it can be. It will mean then you can end up having hundreds, I'm not exa I'm exaggerating, but quite a few KPAs. Now, the more they are, the probably the more they dilute. And if they dilute, that means it might be complex to manage that kind of performance. So, and we have, actually tried, uh, and I remember in some of the sessions in 2018, to take a very complex work format or work profile and say, let us make sure and convert it. And, and if, if some of the HR consultants are in the room with us now probably can indicate how well some of those were done. Because this can be done really, six KPAs can be enough for a normal human person or being, relatively speaking, in any project. Once you go beyond six, seven, and eight, nine, then you are actually going beyond what is possible or feasible within the, the aspect of a, 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 a one to be able to perform. But we're not dealing with the number of saying how many should they be and stop. We're dealing with the context. Let us understand. You might find that if there were six, only there were three key KPAs that were there. I would argue that if we structured accordingly, it can only be three KPAs. Does it mean if there are three, you're not doing enough? No, 
It's about the volume of each KPAs. Because if one of the three is 50%, taking time 50% of your effort and time in terms of contribution towards your your day-to-day -day doing, the others are sharing the other 50%. So I'm just indicating that a rule of thumb say let, 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 let them not be too many. But at the same time, that is preceded by them being defined accordingly. Now, HR, if they do their work properly with our assistance, we are then able to have properly defined work outputs. That is on the KPA side, that is on the work output side, and that is one of the major element of our performance agreement. So we've agreed as to what we are going to be focusing on in the particular year. We've given context in terms of time, resources where necessary. We've also defined KPIs in terms of indicators of what will be the benchmark of measuring such output based on each tasks or activities as defined in this particular template. Then the next section, and probably forgive me if it means this section has been uh, not detail as I have, take some of what I'm giving you as pure uh, information, as opposed to the norm, as I've said, I hope this template I'm using is the latest one, but safe to say, within the university, we already have you know, in, in values, five of them, innovation, teamwork, efficiency, mm -hmm. accountability, and mutual trust. Now, this section does help us to know exactly what does each of these big words mean, innovation, teamwork, efficiency, accountability, and mutual trust. At least when we include it in this format in section B, at least we're able to understand. Now, what was not done, which is why this is not being measured as yet, is what should be observed as a behavioral example from each one of our employees in line with a particular value. Yes, we have got a value innovation. We know what it means, promoting attributes of excellence, creativity, discovery amongst management students and staff. But what should we be observing? as behavioral examples. Because in the absence of this aspect, we cannot measure. We do know what it means by virtue of the definition, but we don't know how we should measure it. So as part of the second spectrum of phase two, then there will be level of detail provided in this area by providing behavioral examples, and those will oversleep in benchmarked accordingly so that we are able to measure them as part of performance. You might have heard uh, Jack Welsh spoke quite aggressively if not in depth about values in his organization, where he made an example of saying, if your output is down, but your value is up, thumbs up, you can be given a chance because anyone can be trained to improve performance output. But if your value is down and performance output is up, depending on the context, he alluded to the fact that you might likely lose your job because values are for him, the most important aspect of organizational leadership especially if you're in a leadership position, not necessarily in all other positions. So in this context of the university so far, this B, uh, section B is not yet forming part of our measurement criteria, therefore it's not part of the, the values, uh, sorry, it's not part of the performance uh, management, it's just that it is part of our strategic uh, goals, objective and values in our current value. That's why it is promoted for that it to be seen uh, within our midst and be encouraged to be observed as well. Now, the last section is section D. So the C it should be C, not D. Uh, should be C, not D. Personal development plan. Now that we have discussed the output required, now that we have discussed the values as they are enshrined in our strategy, what are the requirements? One, what do you require as an employee? That's the first point. What do you require as an employee in terms of development? Number two, what are the needs that are derived from your work? Three, what are the gaps that have been observed as part of previous assessment or discussion that has emerged between you and your manager in terms of engagement? Now, because there are three sources, it might be gaps either through skill gap analysis or a discussion or previous assessment. It might be the need an organization is identified. It might be a requirement that you have. Those will then appear. I need to be trained on uh, computer literacy. Okay. Or I need to upskill myself on computer literacy. What is a suggested intervention is training or mentorship on the job training, a formal course, mentorship or coaching. And what is the time frame? So that should be done by end of March. Okay. And then you list the second one. I need to understand the new 
job requirement in this particular case because I've been given a new tasks. Therefore, I need to expose myself to such. Will it need a formal training, coaching, mentorship? You put that intervention a suggested time frame. And again, three, four, five. No matter how many those intervention would be, what is important to emphasize is that when we talk about personal development plan in the context of a, a performance agreement, we focus on those that are aligned to your job requirement. Some people might ask, am I allowed to study other programs, courses which are not in line with my job? Yes, unless, or of course, if it is discussed with your manager upfront, because there's always this disjuncture of saying, I want to study law as part of my time within the university but I've got nothing to do with legal uh, work or framework or legal, legal aspects in my job. So that, is, it, is it that not gonna appear in your personal development plan? So I, I think the onus is on you and the manager to discuss as to what would that be relevant? Because I'm going back to the original point of saying everyone has got these personal ambitions. Uh, your personal ambitions might not all of them be squarely relevant to the job that you're doing now. So, but if your manager is open enough and transparent, you can tell him that, for the next three years, I'll be beefing up my skills in another field of study because my ambition really is because is to become a legal practitioner. So you don't have to hide that, but does it mean it needs to appear as part of your personal development plan? As long as the priority is on the job we are performing now, on the gaps and the requirements and the needs of the current job, you, I suppose, can do anything else on top of that as long as your current job is not compromised. So, I, and again, I'm trying to be very, a direct in terms of that particular point, because unless if unless if it means an organization does not promote development, it will only will focus on the current job you are doing and nothing else. And I think at this modern time, as we have seen the dynamics happening in the industry, people can be allowed to flourish to be other things only to find that the job they are occupying or the position they are occupying is a temporary endeavor leading to another destination which they desire. So that transparency apply all the way. Uh, throughout both to employer as well as an employee to a land manager as well as a support network. once all the above is done to the satisfaction of both parties and i'm emphasizing to the satisfaction of both parties then they are all good to be able to sign now it's very seldom and i know it might happen that there might be disagreements on the agreement it's very possible and one would wonder what might cause such a strong disagreement during the planning but it does happen and I won't be surprised if it happens in some of the cases. That is when the involvement of HR comes to the party to say, HR practitioners, please come and help us. We have exhausted all options of agreeing in terms of what the plan should be for the particular incumbent, but there seem not to be any light shine upon us, come and intervene. And that will certainly happen until the final agreement is obtained and acquired. So typically, at the end of that discussion, engagement, and preparation, both parties need to sign. What I do know is that HR will put a specific deadline that every new employee who comes join the company should have a performance agreement by end of 30 days. If the policy still stipulate that, and my understanding was that was the case. Within the first 30 days of your employment, you should have a performance agreement uh, for a normal course of business at the end of January. If I'm not mistaken, there should be a performance agreement for all employees. So HR will be looking at submissions from all land managers as to what agreements have been signed and therefore submitted to them. And then HR will oversee seek to assist and intervene where they're being called to do. Now, it's not HR's job to initiate the process. It's a land manager's responsibility to initiate and facilitate, call HR in should they need to, and obviously, together with an employee, they should be able to achieve an agreement and sign this particular documentation as performance agreement. I'll take questions in reflection to this or any other aspect I might have touched on uh, from colleagues if there are any questions. All right, that is a performance agreement. As discussed, we are moving now to performance assessment. Let me just check, can you see the spreadsheet? 
have moved to the spreadsheet now. Yes, yes, we can. We can see the spreadsheet. Okay, awesome. Again, it is black. I'm just going to provide a descriptive analysis of what appears there. And uh, even if it means that any changes, they wouldn't be as fundamental um, because I need to put that disclaimer. As a person who is not involved with the university on a daily basis, anything might have happened and without me having made a proper reference. So, but the bulk of what has been based on this regime is exactly enshrined on this particular uh, documentation. So let's just look at what it has. Obviously, the demographic information becomes standard. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the point of automation. We have requested in our previous report of, of, of requesting the university by virtue of having done certain assessment that if this can be automated, it can do a lot of good to the university in terms of saving time because these tasks can be quite daunting on their own. So we don't want to make performance management on its own a massive task because that would deter people from embarking on it freely. So it would have meant that as soon as you log in into a portal, it will automatically populate your information uh, or the particular information of a particular employee that we work with, number one. Number two, there will obviously a, a major, I'm calling a major of documentation between the contracting document and the performance agreement in a sense that you don't have to recapture this information in a sense that you don't have to go back and recapture all the activities as well as the tasks which were agreed upon in the beginning of the year. I'm sure if my colleagues are following me, they will exactly understand what I'm trying to refer to by an automated system. Because manual as it is, it means start from scratch. Capture the KPA, one as we did the previous document, capture the KPA, two, if it means there were four, then obviously you need to capture all of them. So now that way you might be prone to some errors or mistakes and it always happen as humans try to do our work job and we only find that we're missing a particular button mark or alphabet and that means our system can be compromised in its entirety. So knowing what I know about the automation, sorry about the manual system, I'll then still throw some wind of caution to say if it means not that has not been done, uh, at least universities are aware that that was discussed and it might have been just a mere oversight that this, this is not there at this particular stage. Should Loisy bounce back or any other Asia consultant, maybe they might share with us with it. They might share with us as to how far that is in terms of its, its doing. The scale one to five, as we discussed previously, uh, that hasn't changed. Then the KPA, the activities, as you might have uh, populated them during the planning, and then the KPA, KPIs as they were expected. The only key thing that you need to put in here, what was achieved. So you know the KPA, you know the activity, you know the expectation in terms of the benchmark or the criteria, then what was achieved. So you populate what was achieved, and this can be a sentence, a short description, or any other form of text that can explain what was achieved. So that at least, once you are able to explain what was achieved, you can easily navigate to an appropriate scale that needs to be provided for the rating. For an example, I've mentioned earlier on that before the break, a lunch break, that both employer, the manager, and employee will do their own rating separately. So we are avoiding a situation whereby we don't know who rated what, but we see the final score. It is important then to see, okay, the manager provided a two, as a, sorry, an employee provided a two, a manager provided a three as a rating. So what was the final rating, really? The final rating, and we have avoided to make a formula here. Yeah, otherwise, we could have said, uh, two plus three divided by two, then it becomes a mathematical exercise. No, because these things are discussed, all what we are hoping for and we're driving towards is that both the line manager and an employee will agree on a figure for a particular rating before that figure is populated on a final rating. So it, it has been discussed uh, that why can't we make it as an automated formula? The answer is that will neg negate the, the process of engaging. And we hope by virtue of engaging, we are not opening a kind of worms of disagreements and unending uh, arguing in terms of no, a three, a three, a four, a four, or whatever you. So in this particular case, as you can see there, uh, so we can put a four because both of them would have agreed. But logically speaking, I'm just saying, 
if both of them, one is rated two and one is rated three, it will be unexpected all of a sudden a rating to be a, a rating above either. A rating cannot now come above three because remember a manager would have said two, a three, and an employee would have said two. So when they both sit, they can either agree on three or they can either agree on two. It is unexpected that it can be below either, either, you know? So it can't be less than two if the minimum rating for an employee was two and the manager was three in this particular case. I'm just trying to provide a bit of guide to say, if in the case of two and three like this, after the discussion, both parties would agree, and I'm using a three as a, a, an agreement that would have arrived, arrived at, not because the manager said it, but because both parties would have then agreed onto that particular uh, point. One of the questions ask, are you able to accommodate um, fractions? The answer is, of course you can, but the system on its own does probably prohibit. I'm not, I'm not too sure the last version of how it was rounded off, because as a number, you can put a decimal a, a fraction or decimal number, but if it means the final rating was only used to be a whole number, uh, and I think a 10 if is here, probably can just confirm what would have been the, the, the final rating, whether it's a whole number or it's a decimal. But I'm just saying, because this is number games at this stage, uh, one will ask that question, and, and I, I hope uh, Etienne can confirm as soon as he arrives or joins us back. I'll just remember to ask him as well. But in the, in the final analysis, the numbering that is provided there will be a reflection of the what was achieved by an employee, what was achieved by an employee, what was achieved by an employee. Now, what is important is that this section needs to be completed. Because if this section is not completed, we don't see what we are providing this rating against. Yes, we can see the KPI, but the KPI is under agreement. We can see the task, the task is under agreement. We can see the KPA, which is also under agreement. So this section is one that brings context as to why are we then allocating a particular rating. This section here is a section that provides an indication why are we providing a particular rating? Because that narrative gives us a very good feel as to now that we know the task and the expectation in terms of the benchmark and criteria, how well did this person really achieve or how well did he deliver to be able to deserve a particular uh, rating according to the uh, scoring that is provided there. So at the end of the day, what matters is the final rating in terms of final scoring for the two uh, in, for the two uh, stakeholders, it, it's important for, their, for, for, for the final performance rating to be seen as to what was each one's rating because they would have done this independently. And that does not need to be changed now that they are putting it on the same particular form. Now, as you can see, as I change this, the rating of each of the particular activities, the bottom score also does change. Now, this score, it's a KPA rating. These ones are KP, sorry, the KP, the, the activity ratings. This is a KPA rating. Remember, we spoke about the weight at the beginning of a particular job, a particular KPA. So that means KPA one was rate was weighting forty five percent. The weight of this KPA was forty five percent. The rating of the KPA is 3.8%. And the point that is derived as a result is 171. Now, obviously, in this particular case, I, I, I just need to mention for both the manager as well as the employee, you don't have to worry about the, the, the sums or the output there. You do not have to worry about the output. What matters is what you have completed there. So the system has been designed in such a way that these are automated calculations at the end of the day. It's not what you are aiming for, it's what, however, you are providing input in. By providing this input, that's all what is needed uh, in terms of the final rating, the rest leave it to the, um, the aggregate in terms of HR for them to be able to provide the final uh, rating. Now, as you can see there, uh, the weighting is up to 100%. That's 100 there. That's the weighting. Never mind the points are just an input for calculation purposes. And then in terms of number of KPAs, there are five. And then the performance score is 77. 
for this particular uh, employee. Now, 77, uh, let us just do one more tweaking. Let's go back to 555, which was at the time of opening this template as a demonstration for demonstration purposes and see how does that affect the score. And the score is now 81. So that is why we are saying for the employee and the manager, all what they need to focus on is to discuss their contributing uh, ratings per activity and provide a final rating and that's all. Provide a final rating and that's all. At the end of the day, the system does its own calculation and it, it should uh, check out a particular uh, performance score. And that particular performance score can be compared with the legend of scores in terms of overall performance, which in this case, 81 falls into an exceptional performer. Now, this is not dependent on one task, it's dependent on the overall KPAs uh, for a particular employee, as you can see in this case, all of them were completed with certain scores. Never mind what these scores, it's just for demonstration purposes, after we've completed this particular section of what was achieved, the number was populated there. And uh, at the end of the day, we're having a particular performance score. Now, this score is what is taken with the name of an employee, and the score and the aggregation process will happen at an HR organizational level. So that means once everyone has been assessed for a particular cycle, the organization can then do its further analysis to say amongst 1,200 employees we have, how many of them are exceptional performers? How many of them are occasional uh, or above average performers? How many of them have met the minimum requirements? How many are below and how many are poor performers? You can take the total number by virtue of taking the name of an employee and take the particular um, a scoring of the employee, you can be able to generate a much more detailed report at the end of the day. Now, if you just look at this uh, report here, and I think it might be completed accordingly. Um, Okay, so I'm, let me not go here because I don't think this is being used. But as part of the template, we'd actually design an annual performance summary. As you can see, I'm not going to touch on that because I don't think it is utilized at this particular juncture. But we're going to stick to the output, a performance output uh, rating. This is for, let's assume we were doing a ratings or performance review for end of July 2020. The details above there will be provided performance cycle, uh, exactly the name of the employee on an automated uh, spreadsheet, as you might have seen the summary, it can pull all employees for a department by virtue of their name and by virtue of their performance score. A name performance score, a name performance score, a name performance score can generate a wonderful graph that can provide a very good summary or dashboard with details read into if we need to. Each department doing that, they submit that to HR. HR can collate all that for the whole organization and they can then have a proper bell-shaped curve that suggests to show us that, okay, the university, let us see the level of efficiency in terms of uh, performance levels in terms of our staff members. 20% of them are at this particular performance level. I'm just using that as a number because the importance of having this information data like we said, it's not about looking at a person and penalize a person. It's about looking at the total organizational perspective in terms of performance. Because if the VC and the DVCs, they look and they found that the majority of employees are below average standard performers, I'm sure it will be a fair concern for them to say, what is happening? As much as if they will look and see most of the employees are at exceptional or above uh, exceptional uh, 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 exceptional performers. Not that they will be concerned, but it might attract some att attention. What? Let us see that because all these numbers are translated into an output. So as a manager, you will obviously be aware how well we are doing on the ground. We can then collate that with the numbers, as you see, to give you an indication. You can even take per job function type and let's say, let us look at all particular role players, e.g. secretaries or administrators. Let us see where and how they perform. 
you can look and say, let us look at all junior lecturers, I'm just making an example, and all other different job types, as I've indicated earlier on, from the gate to the cleaner. The intention is to be able to have within the fingertips a system that can be able to give you indication of how people are performing. And then exceptionally, you can zoom into those areas where some people are performing to the uh, level, which is probably detrimental either to themselves, to the department, to the team unit, or to the organization, and be able to zoom into that and be able to say, what is happening? How can we assist? Or oh, those that are doing exceptionally well, how did you do it? How can we learn from you? And be able to take note of that and obviously use that to assist the organization overall in terms of performance improvement. That is on the performance assessment form. If it's done well, <clears throat> without any hindrances, without any issues, it shouldn't take as much. However, and I'm, I'm still maintaining this again, the university is only two and a half to three years old in implementing this particular system. 2018, we're in 2020, as a matter of fact, it's just about two years by end of this year. So there might be some areas that need to be improved the function of everyone being trained, everyone being inducted, everyone being given a chance to understand this will lead to a proper adoption of this very system, will lead to a proper implementation of this very system, obviously will lead to a, an improvement in terms of the adoption of performance man management system and at least be comparable to other highly matured environment as we've alluded to our five rank system starting from negative if it does exist one two three four five of the systematized or operationalized area of uh, adoption in terms of performance management so we are still in early days but we are definitely as a university aiming to improve and we do hope that as new employees in our midst or as new participants in this institution you'll obviously use the basic knowledge you have obtained from this session workshop and from this course to also contribute effectively in terms of providing university with a meaningful indicator of your performances. Obviously, if you are managers, then of your subordinate performances so that the university can tend to uh, or understand the areas of improvement and can assist all to improve in the quest of becoming a better institution and assist you to become a better employee. Uh, those are the two key templates we've covered, we've looked at. I would like to take collectively questions from both a template that has been demonstrated or any comments or any observations um, as we are approaching the end of our workshop. Um, colleagues, are we there? Yes, we're here. I'm here. It's Ne. Yes, it's Ne. Any other comments or any other questions? Well, um, mine is it's just a comment. Yes, sir. I, I suppose the the template for assessment is supposed to 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 have the uh, calculations, and 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 as you put the figures, then it's supposed to add automatically and give you a figure right at the end. Yes. So, what I noticed when I was doing my group. Or my team, I I I found that uh, it was not calculating. What could be the cause? Not calculating at all. Um, I wouldn't know without having looked at it because what I do know uh, is that <clears throat> the last time ATN in particular was very a handful was very instrumental in uh, blocking any personal or individual manipulating of the figures. But that shouldn't have stopped any calculation to take place. 
that should have allowed calculation is just that one cannot be able to do any modification on some of the calculation. And I don't think I have the very same form because this one is part of the template that we're working on as we're designing. But the final one being circulated does not allow any uh, manipulation on the totals, which will obviously fail the whole purpose if it does, but it should have had uh, embedded calculations as I've demonstrated on this particular one. So I wouldn't know, uh, but I'll be keen to probably uh, check with one of the HR practitioners and, and see why it's, it is not. At least on the formulas, definitely should be able to populate. If we do the final rating, if you do the manager rating, definitely it won't be able to add up because that does not contribute to the final. But if you do that calculation, immediately it does pull it down or pull it up, depending on what is your or inclusion on the rating there. As you can see, the figure calculating there. But on the final rating, it definitely has to. Any other comments from any other colleagues? Um, in terms of the job, uh, sorry, in terms of the performance agreement, any experience that you, it's a, I know it's a straightforward word document, but have you had any experience you can share? Whoever has done probably some exercise or some completion of it. The performance agreement, as we, we first covered that and then we moved on to, to this particular one. Anyone who can share how the performance agreement, um, how practical it was or difficult it was? Okay. Um, I, and in, if there are no other further questions, I think from my side, that will be the end of our session. Um, what would have been nice, and I just believe it probably might not be is if it's not properly coordinated, is the <clears throat> exercises that I alluded earlier on, where we work in groups uh, and be able to follow this particular exercise uh, where we work on to a particular uh, job profile and then populate an agreement and then go further to populate the performance assessment for a particular uh, job profile. Now, what normally happens is that when we do that exercise in class, we then we then allow employees to or, or colleagues to present uh, back to the plenary as to how was their experience uh, in terms of undertaking that this particular assignment. I don't think, and I might be completely wrong, uh, but I don't think it will be practical to for us to engage on this particular exercise without um, adequate monitoring. Otherwise, I would uh, hope that both the agreement you do have copies of, as well as the uh, performance assessment form, which is a spreadsheet. And uh, should you encounter any challenges in working with either or both of them, you will duly uh, touch base with your HR practitioner to assist. Uh, where possible or where necessary. <clears throat> okay. Um, if there are no other further questions, comments on any aspect, um, I do know that, uh, like I said, Etienne is not here. It would have been nice to close off with him being here as he opened the session. Um, let me see, just give me one second. I want to see whether 
we can uh, confirm our delivery with uh, Mr. Shandu. Just give me one second, gentlemen and ladies, so that I can make sure that we don't depart having probably missed some other things that were important for us to take cognizance of before we can uh, dash off. I know Shandu is, is also in the core in the session, but I'm just double checking with him. Just give me one second, he is on the line. Sorry for that short. I was just checking with Mr. Shandu. Uh, we may be uh, released. Uh, we have covered everything, uh, but we have noted the limitation in terms of the practical uh, exercises. Uh, but I'm sure if there's any other follow up to be done, we'll certainly be able to do uh, that uh, outside this particular platform. But should there be any questions, I'm always available to assist for those who have attended the session. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time, patience, and the uh, attendance as well.